thank you very much, uh, Peter. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, and for the guests in the Netherlands, goedemiddag. Yeah, so as, as I worked with our experts for 10 years, so I caught a little bit of Dutch as a German, yeah. And the, um, so we want to we wanna speak uh, about uh, the options, how modern defense uh, scenarios um, uh, may be influenced by 3D printing. And uh, on one hand, uh, the very actual fact of uh, problems, uh, military problems in the logistics supply chain, the use of digital twins to transport data instead of parts and have production on site behind the front line. That's the one uh, scenario why 3D printing for metals uh, particularly, but also for plastics. However, we will speak about metals. Uh, is coming uh, is becoming interesting. And the second one for those of you who directly work in the defense sector, uh, I'm sure you have followed the very interesting and uh, partly comical uh, news show we have with the German military, uh, where projects to refurbish existing old equipment, let's say become a disaster. Yeah. So, um, so the, uh, the rebuilding of obsolete parts to have our existing equipment working for a longer time is a very vital request. A lot of military units around the world have at this moment, as we found when we came up with this. Uh, so uh, this is why we see um, the defense sector as one proper application for uh, 3D printing with metals. And let's go a little bit, let's see uh, whether hopefully my, yes, my presentation works. Very good. Uh, so as you see, here, what we've done throughout the uh, European summer, Australian winter, yeah, in Australia, as, as our mother company is in Melbourne and Darwin, and uh, I run the European operations, which we just installed in late spring this year. Uh, so the logistics will become uh, a, a much more important uh, factor in military operations as Although we all call that defense for reasons written in the history books, we all know about that. Um, most of the Western world uh, military forces are engaged in global operations of multiple reasons and causes, and therefore need a global supply network. And if we just speak about the peacekeeping mission in Afghanistan, for example, uh, getting things there, even simplified things, is flying them with military uh, planes and stuff. So it becomes a very costly uh, undertaking. And therefore, if we all together can enable uh, local on-site production capabilities, surely that will be a major step forward for anybody in this. So uh, th there is a lot of things to be looked at. It would not be that you just get a printer from some manufacturer uh, of whatever kind and you solve the problem. There's a big background uh, of research to be done as well as there is uh, training uh, of the operators, finding the correct uh, operators. And I think I spoke about things in this slide already. Uh, so uh, as you see here is, uh, a very colorful a picture of a person uh, working inside one of our printers. But what that also shows is with our printer, and this is not a sales pitch, we have, uh, we have brought the, the whole discussion to a bigger level, so to speak, because this printer where the gentleman stands inside can do parts of one meter by 700 millimeters height and 43 kilograms. And, and that is what has not been possible before, except very specialized one-off installation, uh, as we saw in the last session from Michael from Denmark, which was built up uh, for the Danish Armed Forces, but as a serious product in a transportable, uh, movable uh, way that has not been there before and therefore is a world first. Uh, so uh, what also is a, yeah, point of view, a consideration I like to uh, focus your thinking on is 
so far when metal 3D printing has come into the discussion and the scope in the overall industry, and I'm part of that for the last 25 years, I think, uh, of my work career as an engineer uh, with various companies. So it was majorly the approach to substitute existing manufacturing technologies by a 3D printing technology. And that led to a certain uh, disappointment because usually people found out very fast, oh yeah, metal 3D printing is a nice thing. However, it's much slower, much more inaccurate and much more expensive than what we've got already today. So why should we do it? it of course, I'm, I'm pushing it a little bit in this discussion here, but, uh, but that has been the initial approach uh, we came across when we tried to uh, market uh, the technologies as such. Um, and I have worked for long years with a company uh, with laser-based powder bed systems. So where that is actually the case. Uh, so you, you narrow your use of equipment to a, a very high tech, high complication, super part uh, scenario and not for the every days we need this fast uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's a hundreds of a mil accurate scenario. And this is more where we are heading for. Uh, I, I do not mean at all to educate you in uh, and to uh, yeah, defense operation scenarios. Most of you probably know that better than I do, but uh, what traditional engineers in design and manufacturing would not do as a common approach is, uh, yeah, let's do it good enough, yeah? Traditional engineers would want to do it very precise and very accurate and like the best. Yeah, that's how we get educated. However, in a defense scenario, sometimes the question would be, let's say we have a vehicle and a metal part was breaking and all we need is a metal part repair fast that would make this vehicle take the next 100 kilometers or miles or so because there we'll have a major repair unit which can do a proper job or whatever. So, so often in the military environment, uh, yeah, the, the good enough for the next few hours or the next few days is an option where it is not an option if you fly to the moon or something, yeah? So therefore, what we're talking about here today is, is not so critical in a lot of cases and we'll see what has been done here uh, uh, with the equipment. So if we look at which parts are suitable uh, with the technology we're doing and with similar other technologies, yeah? If you see to the uh, upper left corrosion of components, that there is a chemlock fitting uh, trial going on with the Australian Navy as well and, uh, and we uh, uh, and we uh, have done successful parts even with a Navy certification of the armed forces. So there is uh, also a lot of applications with copper, brass and bronze parts, which are particularly uh, Navy relevant uh, because of the use of those metals against the corrosion. Um, so generally speaking, the reproduction of cast parts is also possible, however, with some restrictions of uh, complexity and internal cavities of the part. Um, so tools, we come to a very nice example a little bit later, which shows very obvious uh, uh, what we're heading for. But also we should not oversell the process, as we say, and say, well, what is not what we should do? Like mm -hmm. complex metal geometries like barracks. Uh, yes, there is copper and brass sliding variants, those we could do, but Roller bearings, not good to do. Cables, not good to do. Yeah, sheet metal, no, not. Nuts and bolts, too easy, not good to do. And very small parts and very heavy duty parts, also not good for this technology. There is traditional technologies that can do that much better. Yeah. Now for a look at how this is done, that, that brings us to one point which is not mentioned in the slide here is uh, does a traditional military education involve three-dimensional CAD design? And the answer I can speak for the German armed forces is no. Yeah, that is not a standard set of knowledge equipment 
uh, for uh, people in the field uh, within the German Armed Forces. This is specialized knowledge for our university. We have two military universities in Germany, one in Munich, one in Hamburg. And, and this is where things are done. Uh, and the initial design of equipment is not done with the military, it's rather done with OEM suppliers. So what we've done as part of the success is we have taken a, a service unit of the Australian Army and we have trained people at the Technical University of Darwin very thoroughly on the use and applications of 3D print design. What we find also, and now I'm speaking again of the armed forces, for example, in Afghanistan, in Mazar al Sharif, is that there's a lot of young people who have a lot of boredom because of the routine service they do there. Fortunately, there's not a lot of uh, combat activities. And they sit in the camp and what do they do? Uh, play computer games or also do play around with 3D printers for plastics in that regard. So we do get young people with a knowledge of 3D printing coming from the mainstream education. That's a new trend that is there for the last three, four years, partly because, for example, Windows 10 offers a simple 3D uh, design and 3D printing program with every Windows computer and, and other areas and the availability of cheap, simple plastic 3D printers for a few hundred euros. Uh, so that is a base you have to bring to the people so they do understand what they can do uh, with this technology. Now, in this case, what we see at the bottom line, and we'll see a little video about that a bit later uh, at the end of the presentation, is people have just replaced a traditional hinge, which from the manufacturer is a weak part of a design and always breaks in a manual uh, fuel pump. Uh, so uh, this is a, a frequent known failure and they could replace that part with an overnight procedure because of the heat treatment, which is the, um, uh, which is the slow factor in that, and had a proper working metal part the next morning, although it might look a little bit clumsy. That's what I meant before. It's not necessarily uh, necessary that this part looks particularly straightforward to a tenth of a mil if the general function to pump the gasoline into the vehicle is fulfilled for the next few hours or days. That's an application you majorly see with armed forces or Boy Scouts, yeah? So, uh, so yeah, what I already mentioned before is that we, um, sorry about this, uh, 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 that we uh, do need to, oh my goodness. That, that we do need to uh, train people for proper use uh, of the equipment. And that is not done in a week or two. That sometimes takes a year or even longer in sessions with theoretical and practical work at the equipment. Here, I would like to point out a common problem of most armed forces in the world as uh, the soldiers, male, female, yeah, they usually get changed in their deployment every two years in a rotation mode. Mm -hmm. So if you train people and your training takes a year or longer, uh, you may fall into the trap that the nicely trained people, once they're trained readily, uh, get taken away from you for another deployment that has to be watched as well. And what you see at the bottom right here is, uh, as it looks, a very simplified tool. That's what the Australians call a gunner's ratchet. Uh, it's a, it's a simplified uh, a tool which they use for uh, the heavy duty machine guns on board the vehicles if, uh, they, uh, if, if they have uh, a locking or uh, a clogging uh, of the machine gun uh, to make it usable again. And what happens actually is they just lose these tools in the field. Yeah, they are somewhere in the truck, in the armored vehicle and stuff and they just get lost in the field because they fall off the truck. It's so simple. And getting a new, simple, big tool like this with a ratchet cost the Australian army 9,000 Australian dollars and a 12 month lead time. We could build that spare part for them overnight. Yeah. 
so we, we made them super happy uh, with that. And that's uh, the yeah, individual things you can do and we did in the initial trial. Secondly, the printing technology. Uh, so you need to make sure that your machine is uh, ruggedized enough and the process is simplified enough so you can use the machine uh, in the field. To be honest, what we did with this machine, what well, the nice camouflage painting and a few reinforcements of the standard production machine, as this was a trial, also to learn from that. But it's one of the points that came out of this trial definitely is that the next machine should be in a container sort of solution compartment, which we can also uh, put under um, air conditioned mode. So we control the humidity uh, of the working environment as working with metal powder is a little bit like uh, working with floor in the swimming hall. So it clogs very easily and uh, you get all sorts of problems uh, assorted to that. Yeah, how, how does our, just one word, how does our uh, system work? Because we're nearly at an end of the presentation at the time. Um, so uh, we, the cold spray is a three times uh, the speed of sound shooting of metal powder to a uh, metal surface, solid metal surface, and the particles solidify without melting. Uh, so they clock together uh, by uh, electron binding uh, of the molecules as well as a uh, mechanical binding by clawing themselves into the unevenness of the surfaces around. So that has been developed uh, early by a Siberian university in the 1980s and has been uh, worked on by several global universities since and is a known process as of today. You, um, you divide that into, sounds funny, hot cold, print, uh, cold spraying and cold cold spraying, which means is in the hot cold spraying, devices are heated up to seven, 800 degrees centigrade, so they can do titanium and nickel alloys and stuff as well. We work in the area of cold cold spray. We're not heating things up further than 300 degrees centigrade. The very big advantage is we do not need to use protective gas. We just need compressed air and the metal powder, and this is it, which simplifies the use in the field for people. So yeah, this is the, the different uh, machines you can get. Uh, usually three steps. The printing of the part as a rough sort of raw casted part, then the heat treatment of the part, and the machining to final dimensions of the part. Depending on the part, sometimes you do the heat treatment first and the machining second or the other way around. So it, it depends on uh, what kind of part it is. So we've done that in Australia for the armed forces. They've got a machine throughout this year. The Navy got a machine throughout this year. The special forces got a machine throughout this year. Sorry, I cannot tell, tell you much about what the special forces do. I was asking, but they said we can tell you, but then we got to shoot you. So I don't know. Yeah, so I'd rather live. And uh, uh, with that, I hope I could give you a fast intro into what's possible and also what's not possible for our edges. I'd like to point out at the end the, the top left part and the second from right part, because one particular uh, property of this technology is we can spray together, bring together, for example, aluminum and copper in layers on layers, uh, which cannot be welded in liquid form uh, because those metals just don't work together. And with that, I think I jump from stopping to share my screen to just a little two minute video, just one second, which is here. And uh, do people, Peter, do people see that video or do I have to share the screen you have to, again? You have to share the screen. Uh, I have to share the screen again. Yes, now I share the screen again. And we want that video and we share and we do presentation mode. And now it should work. It does. We don't hear the audio, by the way. Did you turn off your, your audio, Stefan? 
because we can see it's big lamps, uh, the, the, uh, the, the man, but we can't hear him. So, yeah. yeah, was that giving you a little bit, stop the sharing, stop. So giving you a little bit of an impression of, yeah, just stop the next video. Hello. So, good. Uh, so I hope that was interesting and I, I didn't push the time limit too far. And if there is, or, any questions, you find me on LinkedIn, you find me on the company page, or, and, and Peter uh, and Frank can uh, uh, transmit the contact data as well, not a problem. So thank you very much for uh, your attention.